58. Justice and the Church An important aspect of law and justice is set forth in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 to 13, chapter 19, verse 17, and chapter 21, verse 5, namely, the part of the priest in the court of law. The priest sat together with the judge. They could in times of need be the judge governor of the people. 1 Samuel chapter 4 verse 18, Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 24. C.H. Waller summed up the relation of the priest to the court thus. The priests are the custodians of the law. The judge or chief magistrate is the executor of it. Normally, the priests defined the law and its applicability to a case, and the civil judge passed sentence in terms of it. Waller noted further, It is not sufficiently observed that this defines a relation between the church and the Bible from the time the law, which was the germ of the Bible, was delivered to the church, and that the relation between the church and the Bible is the same to this day. The only authority wherewith the Church of Israel or of Christ can bind or loose is the written law of God. The binding or forbidding and loosing or permitting of the rabbis, the authority which our Lord committed to his Church, was only the application of his written word. The rabbis acknowledge this from one end of the Talmud to the other by the appeal to Scripture which is made in every page sometimes in almost every line. The application is often strained or fanciful, but that does not alter the principle. The written word is the chain that binds, nor does the varying relation between the executive and legislative authority alter the principle. The law must be known and understood before it can be applied. This was the primary function of the priest in the court. The early church took the law seriously and it was believed that in a Christian state or empire the clergy should have some part in the judicial process. Such a view was not well received by the empire. In the Theodosian Code 9.40.15 we have a reference to ostensible interference by the clergy. The law said also 9.40.16 16. Emperors Arcadius and Honorius Augustuses, the Eucitianus Praetorian Prefect, no clerics or monks, nor even those called synotii, note literally fellow travellers, companions, shall be permitted to vindicate and hold by force or by any usurpation persons who have been sentenced to punishment and condemned for the enormity of their crimes. We do not deny to such clerics, monks or synodocei, the right to interpose an appeal in a criminal case in consideration of humanity, if the legally prescribed time limits permit, in order that a more careful investigation may be made in a case where it is supposed that, through the error of the favouritism of the judge, Justice has been suppressed to the prejudice of the safety of a person, provided that whether a proconsul, a court of the Orient, an Augustal prefect, or a vicar was the judge, he shall know that he must refer the case not so much to our clemency as to the most august authorities. For it is our will that their jurisdiction over such cases shall be complete, so that, if the matter is of such a nature, and the crime so demands, they may be able to punish the condemned person more justly. 1. Also, after the time of appeal has lapsed, no person shall either hold or defend an accused person when he is going to the place of punishment under escort, and the judge shall know that he will be punished by a fine of thirty pounds of gold and the primates of his office staff by a capital sentence if such usurpation is not punished immediately. If the audacity of the clerics and monks is so great that it is thought the outcome will be a war rather than a judicial trial, their unlawful action shall be referred to our clemency, so that, by our decision, 
a more severe penalty may soon result. 2. It shall redound to the discredit of the bishops, of course, as shall all other such matters, if they should learn that any of those acts which we prohibit by this law have been perpetrated by the monks in that part of a district in which they, the bishops, guide the people by instilling the doctrine of the Christian religion, and if they should not punish such violations. From the number of these monks, the bishops shall ordain clerics more suitably when, perchance, they think that they are in need of them. July the 27th, 398. Clearly, the code is hostile to the interference by priests. A small opening is left to interpose an appeal, but not to take part in the interpretation of the law and its application to the case at hand. St. Augustine used this opening to intercede in a letter to Macedonius. After Macedonius questioned Augustine's right to do so, Augustine wrote further, arguing, In no way, then, do I approve the faults I want corrected, nor what is done wrongly, do I want to be unpunished because it pleases me. But I pity the man, and I detest his crime or outrage. The more his vice displeases me, the less I want the vicious man to die without being corrected. Common and easy it is to hate evil men, because they are evil. Rare and dutiful it is to love the same men, because they are men so that, in one man, we simultaneously disapprove his fault and approve his nature, and, more justly, hate the faults because it befalls the nature you love. He who is the foe of crime in order to be the liberator of the man is, therefore, not bound in a partnership of iniquity, but in that of humanity. Moreover, there is no place to correct morals except in this life. Morally, Augustine took a non-biblical position. He distinguished between the sin and the sinner and became an advocate of the ancient belief in loving the sinner and hating the sin. Sin, however, is not a thing. It is an attribute of man, a term of his actions, and it cannot be abstracted from the person. Murder is a sin condemned by God, but it is a sin of man, not something which exists of itself, and is thus an act which can be separated from a murderer. There is no murder without a murderer, nor sin without a sinner. Theologically, Augustine should have claimed the right to set forth the law of God as it related to the case at hand, rather than to interfere with what he knew to be a just sentence given the crime. Augustine espoused humanistic pity in the name of Christ, a serious error. Augustine, however, wrote a letter to Boniface, a Roman governor in Africa, calling for coercion against the Donatists and justifying it with fanciful arguments from Scripture. It is noteworthy that in a statement similar to the Theodosian Code, Justin Brennan of the US Supreme Court in Presbyterian Church in the United States versus Mary Elizabeth, Blue Hull Memorial Presbyterian Church, 393, U.S. 440, 1969, said, The First Amendment prohibits a state from employing religious organizations as an arm of the civil judiciary to perform the function of interpreting and applying state standards. Turning again to Augustine, we see that, on the one hand, he interceded in trying to forestall the sentence of a criminal. In the name of correction, he sought to prevent the state sentence from taking effect. He substituted mercy for justice. However, as against the Donatist churches, he advocated coercion. We see here the beginning of a long tradition whereby churchmen view civil offences with mercy and ecclesiastical offences mercilessly. The Church thus separated itself from its biblical mandate, justice in law and society, and its biblical mandate of grace and mercy in ecclesiastical matters. Early in the history of the United States, in the Massachusetts Supreme Court's decision in Barnes v. First Parish in Falmouth, 6 Mass 400, 1810, 
The decision, written by C. J. Parsons, read in part, Civil government, therefore, availing itself only of its own powers, is extremely defective, and unless it could derive assistance from some superior power, whose laws extend to the temper and disposition of the human heart, and before whom no offence is secret, wretched indeed would be the state of man under a civil constitution of any form. This most manifest truth has been felt by legislators in all ages, and as man is born not only a social but a religious being, so in the pagan world, false and absurd systems of religion were adopted and patronised by the magistrate to remedy the defects necessarily existing in a government merely civil. Civil government without God is defective. This is a remarkable decision from a civil court. What is lacking is a like statement from the church, namely, that churches without justice Religion without justice are defective. Where mercy functions without justice, we have injustice and lawlessness, and such indeed are the fruits of antinomianism. The modern state is indeed lawless and evil, but the church has a heavy and central guilt in the matter. It has also been heretical, because in assuming the superiority of grace and mercy to law and justice, it is theologically in serious error. The being of God is unlike the being of man in that there is a perfect unity and equality of all God's attributes. In man, talents and attributes can be and always are disproportionate. One man can be a musician, a kindly, indulgent and generous man, whereas another can be unmusical, hard, miserly and unfriendly. A third man can be as good as our first man, but his basic concerns may be justice and a strict accountability by all men. Man's being is not in balance. Man can still be good in his own way, despite his incapability of manifesting all the virtues equally. In God, however, all attributes are in perfect balance and harmony. There is no conflict between his love, mercy, justice, wrath, law, grace, or anything else. For the Church, as the ministry of God's word to manifest an unbalanced stress is to replace the living God with an idol, the Church is the ministry of grace, but the people of grace receive grace to be restored in the image of God and to serve God. To neglect justice for mercy is to damage both mercy and justice and to warp society. It means also that a defective civil government develops because the wholeness of God's revelation has been broken. Men can create false gods for themselves, even with the use of biblical materials. Idolatry in the church leads to the death of justice in the state. Hence, Peter tells us, Judgments must begin at the house of God. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17.